and Spark Connect session featuring the wonderful, awesome Simon Wiley. You want to say hi? Oh, there you go. He's doing the usual wave. So give us a couple of minutes. We're actually just trying to go ahead and get uh, both this system, which is the, right now on Zoom, and also <clears throat> we're going to be rebroadcasting on Databricks uh, YouTube as well. So just for uh, for fun and games. Um, saying that, we can start off by at least doing a quick introduction and say, hey, where are we based out of? So I'm going to go ahead and round the, round the horn based on what I see here. Simon, where are you based out of, my, my friend? Uh, I, I am based in sunny Kent in England, where it's at I usually say that, and it's raining outside just for the British irony. It's crazy sunny. Like How hot is it? It's really warm here. I, I don't raining. know. We do, we do different numbers. It's it's, it's okay. You can go Celsius. It's okay. I'm Canadian, so everybody in this panel actually can go ahead and understand Celsius. It's okay, man. It's all right. I'm going to have to Google how hot it is. It's 28 degrees Celsius or okay. a balmy 82 Fahrenheit currently. Yeah. So, okay. Well, the, you are in England. I guess 82 is hot for you. So, all right. That's enough. that's hot for us. Our house is on yeah, Street. We don't have sorry, AC. So, no, no. Right, right. Okay. Look, look, we are not making everybody understand about how houses in London are built. Okay. So, that's just, oh, sorry. In England. I'm sorry. Because you're not in London. Sorry. My bad. My bad. All right. Stefania, where are you based on? And by the way, for everybody else that's online, you're more than welcome to chime in and uh, in the Q&A or in the chat and tell us where you're from. Uh, Stefania, where are you based out of? Uh, I'm based out of Amsterdam, which is also sunny and warm. Very unusual. But it <laughs> happens. Cool. Uh, uh, and then, hey, Martin, you 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 up for talking now? I yeah, know, absolutely. I, I know yeah. you're getting the demo working, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm based on out of Berlin, and it's like not as hot as in like England right now, which is weird. I I think we're like 26 ish degrees, so maybe like eight seventy eight. You know, I mean, I'm guessing here. Like we're like Fahrenheit is just like tens, so while like like 70s and 80s and 90s and there's nothing in between you know like i think something like this i, I cool. like this warm introduction by the way you know it's it's very nice for an english person to talk about the weather as a way to start conversation which is what we do it's and it's so so actually having the best weather you know it's like not having <laughs> and so just to finish everything off but i am from seattle washington uh in the pacific northwest uh, we are famous for, you know, it's raining or cloudy. And guess what? It's cloudy. So, yes. Uh, so we're back to our usual for us Yankees. Uh, it is 60 degrees Fahrenheit for the rest of the world. I believe that's 15 uh, Celsius, but I'm actually doing that literally out of my head. So uh, which may mean nothing, by the way. And we got some folks from India, which is awesome, from Alberta. Oh, yeah. Dry heat, 31 degrees. Dude, are you like from Calgary, Edmonton? This is the, uh, Brad from you uh, from uh, YouTube. All right, um, all right. Um, yes, and for folks who are using the Zoom, we have disabled chat. I don't know why, so my apologies. Go, just go ahead and chime in in the Q and A. Okay. All right. Well, then uh, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, uh, we have somebody from Perth. Sweet. Um, all right. Well. Uh, let's start the show. You're probably wondering, okay, that's great. We've got a bunch of people talking about weather in Israel and weather in Perth and things of that nature. That's actually not the purpose of today's session. Today's session is actually about Databricks Connect and Spark Connect, so where you can use Spark from everywhere. So now that we've done that part, why are we go? Why don't we go ahead and chime in and explain to a little bit on uh, where uh, who are some of these folks on why we're talking about Databricks Connect and Spark Connect? So. You probably already know Simon, but I'll still have Simon go ahead and introduce himself. And then I will want Stefania and Martin to also introduce themselves because they have something a little bit to do with this, you know, Spark Connect, Databricks Connect thing. So, so go ahead, Simon, you start first. Okay. Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm Simon. I run a consultancy in the UK called Advancing Analytics, and I spend my life as a data engineer. So I spend lots of my time writing code, ETL automation, teaching people how to work with Spark and all of that good stuff. I do a YouTube channel when I talk a lot about Spark and Databricks and all that good stuff. Uh, and I generally get angry that people don't code properly. That's me. Cool. All right. The on brand for Simon being angry all the time. All right, Stefania, what would you do to yourself? Hi, yeah, I, I'm Stefania. I'm a product manager at Databricks working on the Databricks runtime. Um, and together with Martin, like we um, did a couple of projects. One of it was to kind of modernize the Spark architecture, make its client server very innovative, but 
<laughs> that's what we did, <laughs> which basically enables us to have remote connectivity to Spark, which is really great for a lot of today's use cases. And like one of the things we're using this for is for Databricks Connect, which is basically um, to allow remote connectivity directly from like PySpark and Scala and later on also R to Databricks. Um, yeah, so excited to be here and talk about that. Perfect. Yeah, I Okay. Uh, Martin again. Uh, I'm I'm an engineer by trade. I actually grew up building databases more or less growing up, growing up. Um, and you know, but uh, have come to Spark and you know, like there I've been working with Stefania on these kind of topics and really enjoying it, you know, like like building this kind of like uh, new use cases for Spark and like how to bring it to like completely uh, like new places. I mean, you might have seen like the demo that we did last year during the Data and AI Summit, you know, like showing like Spark Connect on an iPad. You know, like this just like getting started, and I think they're just so cool opportunities that we have. Cool. So, are, are you telling me that Reynolds Shin's uh, <clears throat> dream back in 2015 to run Spark on the iPhone is actually now reality? I, I think you know, like what started out as an April Fool's joke. You know, I, I think like you know, hindsight is 2020. You know, so I think you know it became reality. So you know, we'll take that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, I want to remind everybody again, but there is the uh, the Spark Connect hackathon. Stefania reminded me that we screwed that up last time. So call that. There is a hackathon on DevPost. It's called So You Can Think You Can Hack. Okay. So if for sake of argument, somebody was crazy enough to go ahead and build an iOS app that actually could make calls for Spark Connect, that would turn out to be a really cool <laughs> Hackathon, and there's actually two of them. There's the virtual one that actually closes, I think, this Friday. So get hacking. And then there's also an on-site hackathon at Data and AI Summit on the 26th. Okay. So yeah. now, seeing that, um, and there's 20k oh, in prizes, so <laughs> you should participate. <laughs> yes, thank you. There are 20k in prizes uh, spread across uh, the top three, and also five honorable mentions. So yes. So there is actual money. We're talking about cash. Yay! Sorry. Now, saying all this, um, let's talk about, people are probably wondering, wait, what is this Spark Connect thing that you talk about? And what is this Databricks Connect thing? And so let's, like Stuff, Stefania eloquently called out, Databricks Connect is basically the layer over Spark Connect. Um, it, that, so it works in Databricks, but then what's Spark Connect? Well, then let's, yeah, we're gonna, I'm sorry, we're gonna do a, a few slides here, okay? So let, let me go ahead and jump there. And I'm gonna do the slides, folks. So, uh, and and uh, I will love Simon or Stefania or Martin to chime in and tell me how wrong I am on anything. But um, let's start with this, okay. So if you think about Spark and um, and it's, it, don't get me wrong, it's this awesome thing, uh, awesome system for processing big data. But the biggest problem with Spark is that, and and I've been working with Spark, by the way, since 0 0.8. So actually 0 0.7. So, so I've been doing this, we've been suffering for this for a long time, which is, is it's just one gigantic monolith driver. When we talk about the Spark driver, it's just one gigantic thing, which is really funny because when we talk about, hey, what's the most important aspect of big data? It's about distribution, distribution, distribution. Yet we have everything stuck in this one gigantic driver. And so... This context is like, okay, the application logic, the analyzer, the catalyst optimizer, uh, the optimizer for it, the scheduler, the distribution, all of it's done through this one driver. Okay, so if you want to go ahead and run things through like applications where you're doing SQL, sure, you, th that's exactly why we have Spark SQL. That's why we do all these really cool things. But if you're trying to do this from the standpoint of like IDEs, or you're trying to do from notebooks, or you're trying to do like programming languages like Go or Python, with, they don't. There's no JVM interop. There is no uh, REPL to work with here. Okay, so basically, you can't embed a Spark application, right? And while I was joking about this idea that we would run Spark on an iOS app, and then just like uh, Martin noted that last year we ran it on an iPad, the point is that we can't put this entire thing inside an iPhone. I mean, maybe we could, but that's not very useful. Let's put it that way. Okay. So the context is then, well, then what's the best way to do it? And uh, the, really what it boils down to is that you really need a separation of the client processes from the actual server processes. In other words, the part that says, okay, how do I go ahead and have all of these different systems, whether it's an application, ID notebook, or a programming language, or SDK, how do I talk to the Spark driver and separate what the client operations are from the server operations, okay? Well, then what ends up happening is, is this, what was introduced in Spark 3.4, uh, that came out 
what, a month and a half ago, I think now, um, which is the Spark Connect client API, okay? And the, basically by all these different client applications talking to it, then it can go ahead and interact with the driver. Excellent. So we've got part of the story solved, which is now we have <clears throat> excuse me, these different systems that can actually go and interact with the uh, with uh, uh, with Spark now. Yay! So everything's done. We're done with the we're done we're done with the session. We can go leave now. No, obviously not. So the context is how do we what what does this change to? What does this mean? Okay. So this is I'm going to get all geeky on you because I love talking about this stuff stuff stuff. So again, Martin or Stefania and Simon, you're going to have to tell me to shut up at some point. But what it boils down to from the simplest function here is this. The client is actually sending protobuf, okay, to the Spark server, okay? Yes, yes, everybody, protobuf is back. In fact, if you listen to uh, Scott Haynes and um, and Martin uh, and Matei from, we had a Spark Connect session, I believe three weeks ago. Uh, we basically went off course and started talking about our love for protobuf, okay? So, why do we do that? Because it allows us to go ahead and send this unresolved logical plan, uh, GPRC, language agnostic. Yes, protobuf is back, baby. Okay, so that's awesome. So does that mean we're going to send protobuf from the Spark server, the results back to the client? No, because protobuf is hardly the thing that you want to use to send that much information back. And so we're using Arrow. Yay, everybody loves Arrow. Or at least if you don't, you should, because this is basically has turned into whether we, whether you like it or not, and I do definitely, I definitely do like it, it is the mechanism by which a lot of us are now standardizing when it comes to in-memory interchange, okay? So what it boils down to is that any of the queries that you're creating, a la the data frame API, I'll explain in a second why that's important. Instead of actually going ahead and trying to run it on the driver directly, it's going to go ahead and actually send it via protobuf to the server. It resolves everything, and then it sends the info back from uh, the server back to the client using Arrow. So I'm going to let uh, I'm going to take see if there's any questions. That oh no, okay, no, we're fine here. Cool. All right, I just want to verify no questions. All right, uh, anything that I'm from Miss Martin or Stefania or Simon before I go to the next slide. That that was that was kind of funny for me because I was not involved in any of that. I didn't know kind of you know the the in, inner plumbings you guys were doing, and I was talking about the news of you know releases of Databricks runtimes. I'm like, oh, there's a lot of protobuf functions. Uh, cool. All right, now it makes a lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're we're all learning together. <laughs> exactly. All right. So basically, then we're saying, okay, dude. You, you keep talking about Spark Connect, and you keep talking about Protobuf, and you keep talking Arrow, and, and since I'm a Delta Lake maintainer too, I'm always talking about Arrow. So you're going like, what the hell does this have to do with Databricks? Well, that's more or less the context. The same Databricks Connect that we've created, V2 version now, there are people who have played with V1, two very, very different architectures. I, I won't talk about V1 at all now. So Databricks Connect V2, it's powered by Spark Connect. So those same IDEs, notebooks, applications, partner integrations, whatever else that you are used to, okay? When you connect to Databricks Connect underneath the covers, it's basically using Spark Connect to connect to the Databricks platform. That's basically what it boils down to. So we're all leveraging the same system. So in other words, you don't want to use Databricks and you only want to use Spark. Hey, that's cool. Use Spark Connect. The code base is out there today. Go use it. There's a slight difference between how you want to use them in Python and Scala. I'll do wait till the Q&A section of the demo section before we just start discussing that because then I started getting into class path uh, violations. But again, I'll stop right now. But that's the context, okay? So that this is the power that how allows you to basically go from Spark Connect to Databricks Connect. And it's because they're all using Spark Connect anyways. And so enables you to use these existing, whether it's existing cases or new cases, we have a bunch of examples like the Plotly demo that's in our GitHub. You can interact directly from the ID. And so we're gonna have a bunch of demos today, actually. I'm gonna do the boring ones, the ones that involve basically using Visual Studio Code um, and uh, with the Spark Connect, by the way, I'm actually doing like the, the Spark ones. I'll do that. Simon's planning to do the Databricks Connect one. Uh, and Martin, if your demo works, then we'll do the Databricks Connect one as well. <laughs> that's completely cool. Um, and what was the other thing? Oh yeah, and yeah, and basically you're easily able to integrate with any application, JDBC for PySpark. You wanna create dashboards, deploy anywhere with Docker, with K8. Um, 
not sure why we wrote Raspberry Pi. No, I'm not going to deploy on that one. But <laughs> what I'm just trying to get at is that this makes it a lot easier because now the code base that you're writing actually is running from the client, okay? And it's actually being resolved on the server. So your client doesn't have to be huge anymore. It doesn't have to take that on. Now, one of the things which I forgot to showcase in the slides, I'm just going to uh, jump out of the slides and then I'm going to look at the, the questions here, is that it is currently working with the data frames API. Okay, it does not work with RDDs. It works with data frames and or data sets for Scala, and that's still currently experimental. Okay, so because of that, if I was to run a demo using sc.txt file, i.e. the old for RDD Spark context, which you shouldn't do anyways, but if I was doing that, it would fail in Spark Connect. So just go ahead and convert that into um, data frames and you're good to go, okay? That's basically the call out. So um, while I- It's actually a good example well, where Stack Overflow might lie to you. Well, because Stack Overflow says like, hey, use SC text file. No, don't do that. You know, Spark Session has awesome capabilities to read like text files, JSON, whatever. Don't use Spark Context. That's not the right thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I spend a lot of time in when training people how to, how to start with Spark. It's like, right, this is this is RDD and all these stuff. Stay away from it. Actually, you then teach them this is data sets. Stay away from that as well. That's Scala. Ugh. Data frames is how you actually use things. Properly. But you need to know those things. Because when I first started with Spark, I Googled around. I got a Stack Overflow thing. I got some commands. I'm like, RDD dot. Yeah, I, I could use that. No, no. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> All right, so this is not the bash on RDD session today, okay? We, we, we're, just trying to, we're, just, we're just trying to provide context, but no. In all seriousness, let's go ahead and um, uh, answer some questions. I'll answer uh, one of them, then I'm going to actually ask one of you guys to answer another one. Uh, there is a logistics one about the slides. Yes, we will make these slides available. Um, uh, we'll attach it to the, uh, the YouTube link, and so it'll be inside there, so you'll be good to go. Honestly, you'll probably just want the video anyways, because the rest, we're done with the slides. The rest of this is actually going to be really demo time. Okay, so just want to give you that context. Um, and, and maybe to do a bit more advertisement, there will be two talks, one on Databricks Connect and one on Spark Connect at the Data and AI Summit. So there will be more slides. Exactly. And, and there'll, there'll be more than just the what, five or six that we presented. So there you go. Okay. All right. Um, the, the next question is uh, from Andre is what if uh, he wants to load a Python library uh, for UDF within the context Spark Connect or Databricks Connect? Uh, when do you guys answer that one? All right. I'll take this one. Um, so conceptually, like the, the big thing to understand is that um, the, the behavior of like Python libraries is more or less the same as it is in, in Spark today. So if you're using Databricks, you can install the Python library as a cluster scope library and then just use it in your UDF and it will just work. And so there's no changes there. And if you're using like open source Python, uh, if you're using Spark Connect, you know, like the same way as you're configuring your Python instance there, you basically the, the what's called executor Python and Spark Python and driver Python path. And then you can like fiddle there with the virtual environments. That's why I love Databricks, you know, like it makes it so much easier to work with the libraries, but no, I'm not biased. Um, no, so um, I think this is, you know, it's just, it, it's exactly the same way as you would expect it, you know, like a configure environment. And obviously, you know, we love the feedback. We want to learn more like how you know, our users are, you know, like interacting with Python environments. Are they using requirements TXT? Are they using Condas? You know, there's a lot of, we're going on like to improve this, but essentially it just works as it does today. The question is, should you be using a Python library for UDF or are you gonna get terrible performance from doing that? I mean, isn't this like the reason why I use Python in the first place to do stuff that you can't do otherwise? And if it if you want to mine Bitcoins in Python, maybe, you know, like that everybody's <laughs> gonna be happy. Um, I mean, but, you know, obviously there's a bunch of things, you know, like where it's just so much easier to access certain functionality in Python. I think this is the part where it's like, hey, like, you know, we want to give you the flexibility to do all these kind of things. Like if you want to do like fast data processing, nah, stay away from Python UDFs, you know, like do like SQL expressions. Hey, there are a million SQL expressions, Spark SQL expressions in Spark. Like don't try to re-implement two upper, two lower uh, modulo um diff like in python it's not going to fly like use the sql expression for that 
All right, perfect. Uh, I think we got that one covered. So let me go ahead and ask the next question here. It's like, um, let's see, uh, which one should we go for Databricks Connect or Spark Connect or VS Code Extension when developing locally? And so this is actually has a couple answers to it in all seriousness. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure Stefani wants to start first. Yeah. <laughs> so I can tell she's going like, ah, ah, yes. Stefani, <laughs> why, why don't we start? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, as Danny already introduced, I mean, if you're using Databricks, uh, what we like Databricks Connect basically wraps Spark Connect or, and, and adds like a couple of additional functionality on top, such as like uh, authentication. We now support OAuth and Azure AD and um, PAT tokens and other utility function um, included in the Databricks Python SDK. Um, but under the hood, you're basically using, like when you're using PySpark, you're using Spark Connect. So for Databricks, that just makes it much more easier and more convenient to work with uh, to use Databricks Connect. You can use Spark Connect to connect to like any other Spark cluster. Um, and then regarding the VS Code extension, like um, the Databricks Visual Studio Code extension. So basically, um, it has Databricks Connect integrated. So if you want to debug your code, um, I think at the moment it's an experimental feature. It's in the documentation. You can turn that on and then you can use uh, its auto setup for you using like all the credentials and like the cluster configuration that you have already provided as part of the VS Code um, extension configuration. Um, yeah. So for me, that there's a there's a there's a slight codey fundamental change between which one you're using. So Spark Connect, Data Connect, exactly. You know, depends if you want all the all the extra stuff from uh, the Databricks Connect gives you as the wrapper. Use that. If you're using Purist Python, you don't want any of that stuff. Then Spark Connect is great. Between Databricks Connect and uh, the VS Code extension from from having a play around. So Databricks Connect, you need to specify the local configuration to get your Spark contact when you spin things up. That means some of your code has to reference your local development environments, which from a coding things kind of weird because then when you deploy it, you need to disable that code. So there's a slight difference in terms of your local dev versus your production dev, meaning when you deploy your code, it's not the code that you develop locally. Whereas VS Code extension, because that's abstracted in a wrapper, you have that in your, you know, kind of well, which, whichever extension you're using, that because that's separated out, you don't need to change your code between it. So I, I have a I have a slight preference for the VS Code extension when it's when it's working nicely. I've currently broken mine <laughs> just five minutes before we started. But from that point of being able to have it separating out the configuration and the connection details is going into it rather than embedding that in your code. I have a slight preference towards the VS Code extension for that reason. But otherwise, there isn't a huge difference because it wraps it, right? Cool. That's awesome. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'll probably, we'll probably answer one more, one or two more questions and then we'll probably want to jump into the demos here. Um, so um, let's see. Do you know if we can connect to our workspace cluster via VS Code using the debugger in the context of our Spark cluster and not locally as a Python file? Um, I'm probably going to want a little bit more clarity, actually, honestly, uh, for the Q&A of this one, because, yeah, I mean, we, we're actually probably going to demo. Um, I'll probably do it in Scala and then uh, and, uh, uh, Simon and Martin probably do it in Python, but the context is, yeah, we're pretty much running this stuff directly from like an IDE and then we debug mm -hmm. accordingly. So, yeah. So hopefully when we, let's switch the demos and then we'll, we'll hopefully that will we'll give you some of that context. Okay. So, all right. Um, let me pause for the questions. I'm going to start short, start by showing the uh, fun stuff. Uh, I'm using VS Code, but not in the way you think I'm using it. I'm actually using it just to run Spark Connect and because everybody loves to go ahead and look at everything from the terminal and shell, right? Yes, yes, no, no, okay. Uh, all right, cool. So let's go ahead and start with that. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, here we go. All right, so uh, hopefully y'all are seeing my wonderful beige colored uh, Spark Connect. I've already started the Spark Connect server, so we're good to go on that front. And then basically, oh, actually, you know what? Give me a second. I'm going to, instead of doing, sharing uh, my window, I'm gonna share the whole screen actually. So hopefully this looks okay for everybody. Uh, da, da, da. All right. All right. This looks all normal, guys. Uh, more or less. Yeah. Okay. Should I zoom in, maybe? What do you want to zoom yeah. in? Yeah. I mean, yeah. we have good eyes, but you know, like sometimes. Yeah, I, I know. I know. So okay. So let me 
Uh, da, da, da. Okay, good. All right. So, all right. Uh, no, because I, I just realized I need to show my browser at the same time. So let me go ahead. So this is all running locally. And so I had already uh, started a Spark Connect server right here. Uh, good old fashioned dot spin. So if you are all Spark uh, developers, this is all old school uh, stuff again. And you'll notice that basically localhost 4040, there's nothing here. So we're good to go, okay? Now I'm actually running the Scala version, which means I need to, every single time I have to run it from dot connector and to build it. Now, this is because it's experimental. This is Spark, actually, no, it's not even Spark 3.4. I think this is Spark, I think this is master from three days ago or four days ago, but it'll go ahead and compile it. There's actually a bunch of uh, class path violations, which is why we actually have to do it this way. Don't worry, by the time we release, we won't have that problem. It'll be uh, prop back to dot bin or dot end dot s bin. But okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and run uh, normally what I would do is like, hey, let, let's just go ahead and run a shell, okay? So Spark shell, I'll eventually type today. So perfect. So it'll go ahead and up and running. But you, the first thing you'll notice right away, uh, whenever this kicks in, hopefully my laptop didn't run out of memory, it's actually going to 4041, not 4040. In other words, it's not going to the Spark Connect one here. It's literally going, generating its own uh, connection. Okay, that seems pretty boring, but the point is, I'm, let me go run it so that way you'll see the differences. All right, so let's go back to this. All right. All right, so I'm going to, yes, I, I call myself out. I took an old, old demo and decided to go ahead and run sc.connect.txt file. In other words, the good old-fashioned Spark Connect, okay? Now, because this is, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Spark Context. So this obviously works because I am just doing standard connection to Spark 3.5. Here's the answer. Good to go you'll notice that it's running on the 4041, okay? Because that's actually literally just a new local shell that I just generated, okay? Local instance. It is not running on the Spark Connect server, the 4040, it's not running there, okay? So, so far so good, all right, no problem. And then if I was to continue with this demo, um, da -da 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 -da, I'm gonna run the exact same thing again, but this time on this screen, there's this very obvious portion of the shell that says Spark Connect. So I believe y'all are seeing the fact that this is a Spark Connect connection right now, okay? So I'm gonna go run it. Well, then the compilation failed. Why? Because it's trying to use SC, Spark Context, which doesn't work. So this is me just over harping on that one particular point. Nothing's happened yet because it couldn't even compile the thing. So in other words, it was never even submitted to the server yet, okay? And nothing's happened here. There's, it's <laughs> We're doing nothing to that particular instance now. All right. So let's actually do it the right way. And so I'll actually just run this one and go back to Spark Context, uh, Spark Connect, excuse me. So now it's actually doing a proper, uh, a, a, a proper data frame API. It's still going, don't worry about the legal reflective. That's me because I decided to compile everything on Java 11 as opposed to Java 8 because I was too lazy to switch back to Java 8. I, I, I'll stop because I'll get into complaints about Java class paths and all that stuff. But the context that now it's all running we're perfectly good, we submit it. Now, what's happening? Did I run this on my local instance, even though it says Spark Connect? No, I did not, there's nothing here, okay? But I did run this on the Spark Connect server and it's very obvious now that I'm, so, so remember, the difference between running this through Spark Connect is that I have a client app, the client app actually compiles, runs, and then executes, sends protobuf to the server the server goes ahead and actually does this. And this is what you see, Spark Connect session IDs with its plan IDs and everything. And it submits Arrow from the server back to the client. And that's what you see here, which is also why I'm getting a whole bunch of uh, illegal reflective errors because, <laughs> oops, <laughs> I went ahead and screwed that up. All right, so that's cool, you say. Th that's right, you're running on your local box, you're running Scala or, and we can run Python, but I could do that anyways right why why do i want to run this in spark connect because come on dude like you could have just run a spark shell and be done for the day and if i insisted i want to use in spark context with the uh, rdds i could have done that you're limiting why do i want to do this well part of the reason i want to do this is because uh we have a, a really cool experiment uh one called spark connect go okay and so that is uh oh i forgot to put that here uh ah uh, Uh, there you go. 
So boom, okay, so this is the Apache Spark Connect client for Golang. Okay, so you have to follow the instructions to compile it. I'm not gonna make you go through all that stuff, but the context is then now I can run a demo, which this is exactly the demo command that we have there. And what's happening here is then now I'm executing from Golang, Golang is now submitting the query to the same Spark Connect server. If I go back to here, all right, whoops, look at the jobs. This most recent one here, this is the query that came from uh, the Go from, from Spark Connect Go, okay? So in this case, it, it, I purposely use a random different query so that way when you look at the UI, you notice the UI is completely different, okay? But the context basically is that I am, this. if you look at the, 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 the query here, this is what the query is, okay? Now, for all you Golang folks, you're like, oh, this is pretty easy, but literally it's a Golang Spark SQL. Here's the, here's the Spark SQL query that you, uh, that you used and we executed this directly from Go. So this is pretty cool. So this is why I'm saying to you like from the, this is me you know, being shamelessly plugging the hackathon again. If you have some ideas to improve this particular uh, uh, show, uh, 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 pro, um, uh, sample, or you wanna help like, you know, for example, create the Rust one or the iOS uh, client connect, uh, uh, Spark Connect uh, client, by all means, this is a great idea for <laughs> for the hackathon. We'd love to see more examples. But this gives showcases uh, the flexibility that's entailed now with Spark Connect. And now I'm not stuck specifically using Scala or Python now. I'm actually able to go ahead and showcase this using completely different languages, more modern applications like Go, like Rust, like an iOS app. Cool. So that's it for this part of the demo. I want to stop and pause now. Um, have you guys ping us any new questions based on what you saw so far before we switch to the next level demos? And then, of course, for uh, for the panel here, Simon, Stefania, Martin, if there's any other questions or things that you uh, that I should have called out, which I forgot to do. There's a bunch of questions. So we can okay. pull out some of the questions on uh, YouTube and Co. A few people I think probably answered. But so Databricks Connect works for Scala. Thank you, Ruben. Yes, yes it does. Yes, we, we, which since we just showed it, yeah, it, it absolutely does. It, like I said, it's uh, just, we... it's, it's experimental, that's all, yeah. Yeah, it's private preview for Databricks Connect. Um, it's experimental for Scala. And can we do work from IntelliJ as well as not just VS Code? Uh, the demo I'm gonna show you is just, it's, it's Python. It's wherever you happen to be running Python is absolutely fine. You don't need VS Code for it. Um, that's two of the questions. There were two from YouTube. Uh, other bits and pieces, uh, why use Arrow? So we're using Arrow outside of its in-memory purpose if we're sending it down the wire. Why not use uh, other things like Parquet? So what is, why is Arrow good for interchange outside of the single box? Right, I think the, uh, I mean, Parquet has some interesting like uh, downsides of like requiring basically buffering a lot of memory. And I think like Arrow is just more feasible like for this kind of like over the wire transport. And I think, you know, like it has just standardized as like, but even as an interchange format between different applications. So, you know, like when we built like Spark Connect, it wasn't just for, you know, like the obvious use case of like Python, but, you know, like want to make sure that we find something that is like easily usable, you know, like from Polar. So I've been digging in the code base there and like trying, hey, like, how can we make this happen? I've played with R, you know, like Arrow just works everywhere. And I think this is this great achievement by the community, you know, and I think, you know, there's part of it where you say, hey, we just have to leverage this because we want that all of our users like can use Spark from everywhere. I mean, this is, you know, my motto, like use Spark from everywhere. And, you know, like no matter the language, like Swift, PHP, I mean, I build prototypes in Ruby and PHP. I mean, like if this is not the, the least, like the least, you know, like expected, you know, programming languages and it works, you know, and I think that's why Arrow is just so powerful, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And just to add to it, like, for example, when, if you look at the hour community, Martin already called out, for example, Polars. There's also Data Fusion. There's also all these other aspects of the hour community uh, that, whether it's programming languages like Rust, uh, Python itself is actually, with PyRo, is extremely well maintained. The, the, honestly, the biggest problem with Arrow right now is that they're pretty much upgrading it every two weeks now. <laughs> I think that's, but it's all on their way to basically targeting Arrow 1.0. And that's what actually, if you join the Arrow community, that's what you're seeing. And so they're making a lot of these updates based on the uh, requirements for many different languages from many different frameworks. So it's just naturally become that interchange for a lot of systems for, again, just a harp on the Delta Lake stuff. Yeah, that's the whole reason why we utilized Arrow because it allowed us the maximum 
flexibility to talk to most frameworks, not just Spark, but to Trino, to Flink, to everybody else too, and also languages at the exact same time. So it's just become sort of the, the interchange, the Franca per se of a lot of these systems, whether it's a language or a framework. So it just naturally made sense for us to all go do this basically. Cool, uh, let's see. Um, there is an attendee that says uh, there is not able to get uh, Spark Connect to work with the Delta Lake library. That's a little surprising, honestly. Um, why don't you ping me or join the Delta Lake Slack and maybe we'll get some details from you because yeah, almost, almost all of our demos have Delta Lake in them. So uh, it should work fine, but by the same token, yeah, like maybe there's something, some configuration issue or something like that that might be coming into play. So sorry to hear that that's happening. Join us at go.delta.io slash Slack. That's our Delta user Slack. And I'm pretty sure one of us will be able to answer that question. Okay, cool. Um, next, want to start going to demo time, back to demos? Because we only have 25 minutes left, I just realized. So I did yep. a lot of talking, sorry. <laughs> and you want to go next, Simon? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 I can do. I mean, you can, you can call it my demo. I'm essentially stealing Martin's demo, which is uh, the best kind of demo. Good. Oh, like God, it. yeah. Exactly. All right. You've actually uh, him. You're fine. So if I share that, you guys see that all right? Looks great. Good. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so essentially, we'll share the a GitHub link. So this is the essentially a self-running little Python app that runs using Plotly. Gives you a little nice web dashboard, but uses Spark as the back end, which is all nice. Uh, and I came into this blind. I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, can, I can set this on this. It'll be fine. And it took about five minutes. And I was like, oh, I can set this up. This was fine. This is actually really straightforward. So. I'll go through what you need to do. So I just cloned the Git repo, got it local, uh, opened it up in VS Code, and there's a couple of things that we have to make sure we had. So yes, pip installing the local requirements. Local requirements aren't particularly much, uh, but in terms of kind of what's going on inside there, it's mainly dash plotly and Dedrick Connect. So it is using Dedrick Connect behind the scenes of this thing. So if you're building your own app, that's essentially the requirement that you need. So dash is the nice website that we're going to see as a result of it. Plotly's our mapping tool. The main thing is using Dataverix Connect as the library that we then need to do that talking back to our Dataverix cluster in the back. Couple of limitations in terms of things that we need to be aware of. The main thing, it needs to be Unity Catalog enabled. So if you're going to use uh, Dataverix Connect, the workspace you're talking to and the cluster you've got spun up has to be a Unity Catalog enabled cluster for it to work. I assume that's because that's spinning up your Spark Connect server and doing that interchange for you, and it has to live somewhere. So I first tried, tried to use this with a non-Unity uh, Catalog enabled, and it, everything went badly. So I then actually read the documentation and switched things over, which makes sense. When you read the manual, things work a little bit better. OK, so having done that, having checked that install, that, that was all quite happy. Uh, then requirements to go and change one little thing in here. So there's a bit brings in dataref.connect.session. So you'll actually sort of have that in there, but you need to configure that. So your local machine needs to have something that tells it how to connect that Databricks workspace. And that's actually, if you've ever done much with the Databricks CLI, it's using the same thing. Um, that's now hiding, that's hidden behind there. I can bring that over. Ooh. So I've got this sitting around. So if you go in Databricks, you've got the CLI installed and use Databricks.figure. Uh, what that's going to do is place a local little configuration file uh, on your local user. And that will have essentially the host name, so where the Databricks workspace is, and some way of connecting, probably a PAT token. So you need to have previously created that config file and have that profile and have a PAT token installed. So regardless of whether you're going to use a VS Code extension, regardless of whether you're using Databricks Connect, you're going to need to tell that how to connect to your service somehow. So I'd already gone through, I'd set it up. I've got two different connections set up in there. And that's basically all we needed. So inside the main app, let's scroll down. I've got a bunch of stuff in here. So first things first, it's importing all those things. It's bringing in those Dedrix Connect things, bringing in the various libraries that we actually care about. There's a bunch of html -y stuff to do with the app. Ignore all that stuff. The main thing is then talking about this piece. So that is asking for a profile. That profile relates to something in that config file. I need to have gone and registered 
So that Databricks CLI, Databricks configure, give it a profile name. So I've got one called Unity. So I knew I was using my workspace that has Unity enabled. And I've got a cluster ID. So that is a cluster that exists inside that workspace that is currently running. That's all you need. So as long as you have a Databricks workspace knocking around somewhere, you've got those Python uh, files required, or you've ran the requirements file and actually installed these things. So using Unity Catalog, you've got a cluster, then we're good. So first things first, I can just run this thing. So we can say, yep, yeah, I'm going to run this. Going to run through that code. Going to make sure things work. It's going to use dash. So I can actually then open this up. Let's just grab that in another window. OK. So that is automatically going and kicking off and running. So that's actually quicker than I thought, because actually my cluster was already turned on. Ah, there we go. And again, similar to uh, Danny, we can dive over. We can have a look at compute. We can see that cluster that's sitting in the background. Just go and dive into the UI. And we can see it's coming in, and it's running that nicely for me in the background. So if we go through and rerun something, we go and change the thing it's doing, our counter trips. That's going back, pushing it back, and going and talking to the server. Now, that sounds like nice and magical. And yeah, there's an app, and it looks like it works. And there's a library in the middle, and things happen. I was like, well, let's just have a look at the code and just kind of pull some of these pieces out. So as part of it, I made a little new notebook file as part of uh, what we've got in here. Get rid of that. I grabbed the same imports. I grabbed that same just little connect file. Um, and so we can, we can do the same thing. We can have a look what's actually happening in here. So this is the main function that's doing the update of one of those charts. Again, I just pulled it out just from that app.py, just grabbed that code, made it as a separate cell. And we can run that same thing. So we can do it the same way it was actually running. We can go and repeat that, and we can change those variables. And that means you can start having a play with that code and go, OK, so what's that, what's that actually doing? And then we have a look and go, oh, it's just data frames. It's just doing data frame things like any other Sparky notebook. So we can go and grab that, and we go, OK, let's test. Is this actually working? Can I go and create a little local data frame? Yeah, perfectly happy. We go and see what the data frame is. Yep, perfectly happy. And again, that's all running, going back, talking to my Databricks cluster, going pushing it that way. So you can run a local notebook. But the only difference is if you're running an exact same notebook the way that you're trying to dev it, if you're using the Databricks browser, the only difference is you need to import that library at the start. So you need to have those bits installed, uh, imported at the start of your notebook. And you need to initialize your session rather than that being done for you as part of the notebook. But as soon as you've done that, the rest of the code is exactly the same. You can use it exactly the same. You can go and play around with your data frames. You can da, 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 step through code in magic. Uh, not in that thing, because I did it as part of that. But yeah. <laughs> so you can have breakpoints. You can go and play around with it. You can treat it like a local piece of code. And it's, yeah, you're just using a local ID. The only difference being you need to have configured which workspace is pointing at. Ta-da. This looks awesome. <laughs> so do we have a working demo of the Databricks VS Code extension? Or can I just shall I just point at my one which currently has a little flag saying not working, but I can show what it looks like? Uh, I mean the only I unfortunately it's not working as I want to. I could just like show like how debugging in VS Code of Python application looks like, but I mean that's more or less what you have already. So I would like give the floor to you if you want. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is what happens when we decide to do all these sessions live together. This is this is so at least you know it's all real because <laughs> so yes, go ahead, go point to the one that was before it got mucked up. <laughs> I realize I made my thing a strange size. Okay, good. Uh, okay. yeah. So this is option one. So option one is writing something in Python. It's importing the Databricks Connect library, and then doesn't matter which Python editor you happen to be using. You could be writing it in Notepad and running it through the terminal, in wherever, if you really hate yourself and like to write code that way. Um, if we want to switch around and go, OK, we don't want to do that. We want to actually, I want VS Code or whatever IDE I'm using to be managing that and essentially, essentially just store that somewhere for me. Then we can set it up. So I'm just going uh, to close down this folder. I'm not going to save anything. Who saves things these days? I'm uh, going to open up a little source directory where it's just playing around. Main problem is I installed a, a local Python virtual environment in here. That has confused everything. 
<laughs> basically, I was messing around and I managed to break things. Now, this is just normal folder. I've got a straight kind of uh, notebook I imported. Now, the only difference is this notebook has none of uh, those bits. The only thing it's got a generic Spark session builder. So that's not going, and I'm not having to tell it configuration, I'm telling it workspace, I'm not having to tell it anything. So I can actually leave that in my code quite happily. So that is nice. So that's nice generic code. I can deploy this code and it would work. Ignore the, the runtime error. Just, let's just pretend that worked. Now, the main thing you need to have done to get any of this to work is to install the local extension. You actually see down in my list of random extensions I could install, there is one that might look very familiar down at the bottom, which is my Databricks extension. This is a little wrapper handler that's going to manage my connection and figure out, am I actually connected? So you can see some of the things are quite nice. So it's got the profile that I'm currently working on. So similar to what I had to do in my code, I have to configure this. I have to say, which of my connectors do I want to use? So you can see currently in my local config file, there are two different profiles. One, my local workspace that I use for scrapping around. One, my Unity enabled one. I can choose which profile I'm currently connected to. That is just looking at what's in your local config file. So if you register a load of things in your profile file and you have a load of client names in there, you have to delete all of those. Otherwise, it'd be really bad for a demo. Cool. Um, I then get a choice of cluster. So I can see which is the cluster I'm currently connected to. So I can see that will give me a list of what clusters are on the workspace I'm pointing at. Currently, there's only one cluster that's there, and I can see it's turned on currently. So I can go through and configure what's the, actually the running environment of this based on everything that's in. The thing that isn't working for me currently is what it actually does is it creates a Databricks repo copy in your workspace and then syncs your code between them. So as you're playing around with something, you'll hit save, and that will sync the code over there. So it kind of just pushes a version of the code into the Databricks workspace. You see that's currently got a little stopped uh, because my Python environment is a little bit scrubby right now. Well, I can see down at the bottom, if I just bring this up a little bit, if, I, if I'm in this state, I can see I've got that little Databricks connect button down at the bottom. Now that lack of sync is what's currently out. So if you've set it up and you've got a clean Python environment and you've configured your workspace and you configured your uh, cluster, you'll see it's happily got a sync set up and then you'll see Databricks connect enabled. And then once that's done, the rest of this will work like a Spark notebook that is in Databricks. And you can step through and you can run your code and all of that kind of stuff. So it's a slightly different approach. You're using an external tool that's then managing that configure rather than baking it into your code. But as long as you're not setting up Databricks virtual environments randomly and breaking all your dependencies, it's nice. That's all I've got to show you because it didn't work. <laughs> But it worked. It, it worked before, so it's fine. <laughs> it worked this morning before I got the other yeah. demo work. <laughs> it's okay. Do you want? Do you want me to actually run a quick demo uh, using uh, IntelliJ, where it's just showing with the breakpoint, and you can look at some of the code real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's All good. right. You know, heck, you know what? Give me a second. Let me verify that this actually works. <laughs> you mean that you actually tested worked. it in advance? Ugh. Oh, well, I tested it like an hour ago. So technically it should have worked, right? Like it should have. Yes, maybe? No? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. It's working. Yes. All right, cool. Then let me go ahead and show you my, I'll, I'll just show IntelliJ in this case. Uh, the, I'm just using IntelliJ just because I was lazy and that was the, the one that demo worked with first. <laughs> Sorry, this will work perfectly fine in VS Code. I accidentally muted myself. So. Um, so basically I've got a UI there. This is go, this is actually to show you that how it's working on the, on the Databricks UI, but it's fine. Um, this, this is actually how you would normally build the Databricks session, but I, this is not a real one, obviously. Uh, but the idea is that I went ahead and said, okay, well, you know, let me go ahead and uh, the right way of doing it is not to use that, but actually use environment variables, configure them. And then that way you can just use Databricks session, build a remote create. This is why I left the uh, comments there. Okay. So saying that, then literally, this is querying a unique catalog table here, like uh, um, this is Val Spark to create a session. The data frame is Spark read from uh, samples.nyc taxi.trips. Uh, then I ran this particular query, and sure enough, here's, here's the results of it. And so I'm going to hide this, and I will uncomment this, and then run this in debug mode. 
uh, and this is the first time I've run it in a while. So yes, okay, it looks like it's working. So not only do you have the results when you look at the run, which is uh, uh, which will be coming up. Oh, I actually need to finish that. But you can debug your code and you can look at all the different um, versions, variables, everything directly inside your IDE. So in, in other words, because if, if you all were with me in, in the person, I would ask you all to raise your hand and say, how many of you love looking at Spark UI logs or the Spark error logs? And then none of, okay. So, and then Simon, for some reason, is raising his hand, but the rest of you all would say, no, we hate you for asking that question. That's actually all what all you would say. And that's a valid answer. Okay. And so the context is now with your ID. Again, this is using IntelliJ, but it's fine. Use VS Code, whichever one you want to use you can start debugging your Spark code directly on the client. This is connecting, this is my local machine that's connecting to a Databricks Connect instance. So a Databricks instance, excuse me, right? You wanna do this with Spark Connect with something else, that's fine, uh, more power to you. But right now we definitely are switching back to Databricks Connect. And so, yeah, this is, uh, either way, you can use your ID to go and debug it. So this is pretty cool. and. It's going to be, I'll make things a heck of a lot more powerful now that I can go ahead and just start doing things like this, which is pretty sweet. Hey, Danny, I think what would be awesome is like go to evaluate expression and just type uh, df.count. You know, just to basically show, like, hey, you know, like uh, in the evaluate expression. Uh, oh, there. sorry. Yeah. Df.count. I thought you said, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I thought you said valid. Yeah, yeah. Nah. Uh, and, so basically, you know, that's the cool part. It's like, hey, like when, I mean, who hasn't loved debugging ETL, you know, like, and now it's like, hey, I have this weird transformation. Like, what is this actually doing? Like, and now all of a sudden, well, you can just interact with the data frames, you know, in Scala for all intents and purposes, you know, like interactively, it's like a Scala REPL, like, I mean, yeah. in an IDE, I mean, like, that's crazy. It's like, this like always like gets me. It's, like, it's kind of like, hey, I can look at this stuff. I can inspect it, you know, like I can play with it. I can show it. It's like I can iteratively manipulate my code in Scala. Sorry, I'm, I'm actually having too much fun right now. So, <laughs> but yes, so that's more or less the context for everybody, right? That you can literally run all this stuff directly from IDE. Thank you. I completely forgot about the DF count. Uh, and that is actually even cooler. So that's awesome. And so that's the context directly. And remember, this is now not running from my local machine anymore. If I was to show you my other screens, the, it, nothing would have happened. This is running from a, a Databricks session set. Okay, so pretty sweet. Um, I think that's it. We've got like three minutes left. So we probably will just wanna switch to the, any remaining questions. Um, yes, that would work, yes. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, wow, there's a lot of questions here. Okay, uh, let's start with this one. Uh, do you still need Unity Catalog enabled workspace when using Spark Connect and not DB Connect? And the question is for whether it's using IntelliJ or VS Code or whatever else. You're not muted, Stefani. You can direct. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was rereading the question. So the question is, uh, when using Spark Connect and not DB Connect, um, I think like on the very technical aspects, I'm not. I think the answer is the same. If you're using Spark Connect or DB Connect, it needs to be a Unity Catalog enabled workspace. So basically, all of that in Databricks works from DBR 13 onwards. It's based on Spark 3.4, where we G8 um, um, PySpark with Spark Connect integrated. Um, and Databricks Connect um, has a dependency on like Unity Catalog permission service. Um, so yeah, you, you actually need a Unity Catalog enabled workspace and a single user or share cluster um, to connect to. Cool. And then I probably have uh, another question that's also related to Databricks Connect and Unity Catalog. Uh, it's the anonymous person had in the Q&A asked the question, which one do you recommend, VS Code extension or Spark Connect, if in a workspace Unity Catalog is not enabled? Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of yeah. the same answer as before. Yeah. So you can use the VS Code extension without Databricks Connect. So you can basically develop Python locally and then like run it all on the cluster. Um, that works with like any DBR version, as far as I know, or like with the newest ones at least. Um, but it's you don't get the um, the debugging capability. 
So one thing to iterate there, like, I mean, essentially what VS Code does is text in, text out. Well, so if you are running this using like the command execution API, how's it called in like crazy technical terms? It's like, it's essentially taking your Python code, like putting it like in a text file, sending it to the server, submitting it on the cluster, waiting for it to finish and then copying standard out back to you in your shell and telling you this is awesome. And I mean, like this is, you know, like the kind of fidelity that's missing there. I think this is really what like DB Connect brings to the table. It's like, hey, you know, like, I mean, obviously everybody loves Spark, but you know, like reasoning about text output is hard, you know, and then this kind of like interactivity is kind of really awesome. Cool. I think that's it. I mean, unless there's anything else we can add, I think we've definitely covered all the, the key basics for today, at least. Can I, I, I wanted like, there's this awesome open question, like for Pyodite, you know, like, because, you know, I'm an, I'm an old nerd, you know, at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, there's right, one it. question, like, have anyone seen using Python in a web browser to connect using something like Pyodite? And I think this is an awesome question. And I would, again, point to the hackathon, you know, like, hey, so I've been playing with Pyodite. You can get a lot of like Spark Connect working in Pyodite already. There are some like interesting questions around like Arrow, but I mean, hey, this is awesome. I mean, like, again, uh, this is all gRPC HTTP2. So if it doesn't work in a browser, then um, we're doing something wrong, you know? So yes, you can get it working. It's not officially supported, but you know, if it scratches in it, you know, like go try it out and like hack on it. So please use this time for our hackathon. Perfect. Okay. Well then let me end today's session. Uh, thank you very much for everybody who, who has joined. Uh, thank you for uh, Simon, Stefania and Martin for joining today's awesome session. Um, and uh, I'm going to do a shameless plug again for the hackathon that we were, we keep talking about over and over again. It's called, so you think you can hack. All right. Join us at Dev Post. There are already 720 participants. So we're like, okay, it's a little bit bigger than we thought we would. Get. So pretty sweet. So we got three more days to the deadline, depending on the submissions or depending on uh, the ask, we may extend it by three, two or three days, but we really do need to close it up uh, next week. So either way, it, we might extend, but not by much, unfortunately, uh, just due to this timing of everything, mainly because we also will have an on-site hackathon at Data and AI Summit uh, for on um, LMs and Smart Connect. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much, for everybody, for attending and joining today's session. And let me turn this uh, screen share off. And again, I want to thank Simon, Stefania, and Martin, and of course, the great Carly uh, for today's session. Thank you so that's much it. for having Good us. Day, bye. Bye. <laughs> All right. That's it. Take care. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone.